Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> can you read it? Yeah, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Good. Well, good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> yes, good <laughs> afternoon from us. Yeah. But yeah, what's you? your day over there? Uh, really miserable and grim. We've got um, grey clouds and it's all, yeah. It's had, we had horrendous weather, but I can't really complain. It's just weather. It's just you know weather. It's, yeah, you know what yeah. it's like. It's not yeah, spring just, yet. We keep being you know, snowed in and stuff. So even now in April, we keep getting snow. So you know, this is the point where you tell me how gloriously warm it is in Perth. Well, yeah, it's terrible. So what I'll, what I'll do is I'll just show you the, the sky from outside. And... <laughs> Oh my goodness. Wow. Sunshine. Wow, look at that. Look at that garden. Oh my goodness. So I can see why you left. When I show, show her blue sky, she's like, no, don't do that to me. Yeah. <laughs> I'd show you my grey back garden, but it's really depressing. It's just, actually, it's, it's a bit of a whiteout. There's just cloud. Oh, but still, that's, it's, it's just uh, weather, as you say. It's just weather. It's not good or bad, it's just weather. That looks amazing. <laughs> so, well, one day when you're in Australia, you'll have to come and see. Oh, definitely. I would absolutely love to come across. We were in um, uh, Sydney a couple of, uh, last year, um, for my dad's yeah. 60th. Uh, and we spent about two and a half, three weeks, because we went over with the whole family to see some friends. It was lovely. But even just... Yeah. Like a tiny bit of Australia takes a long time. Yeah, it does. And um, but I'm sure because you're doing lots of nice courses and stuff, I'm sure that's the next thing. We'll, well, we'll get one day. <laughs> yeah, come over and do a little bit of a, a working holiday in Australia would be awesome. Yeah, would be great. So I'm not sure what we're going to chat about because I feel like I'm. Uh, uh, I'm not actually doing any research into pain at the moment. Um, um, more just interested from a clinical point of view, um, and uh, so I'm not sure uh, quite what what we were going to catch up about. But I was yeah. excited to talk to you. Yeah, I just think I'd like to pick your brain. Your brain is amazing, and I think that having um, it's a real privilege for me. So thank you for talking to me to have um, you for a little bit of time to pick your amazing brain having um, it took me a couple of seconds to put together your name with because I did my master's a couple of years ago and put together with a couple of papers I was like hang on a minute you did those papers okay now I understand so um, I'd love to pick your brain and kind of um, put the two things together a little bit if that's okay yeah, sure so because um, are you are you working clinically at the moment still yeah, so I do four days in the clinic. So I share the a clinic with Peter O'Sullivan. Right. And, okay. and a sports physio, Chris Perkin, who's our, um, he works for our Australian rules footy team in Perth, the, the West Coast Eagles. So we've all got our other little hats. So yeah. Peter also teaches at Curtin University. So I do a day and a half. Oh, Jordan. Um, a, a day and a half at um, Curtin University, uh, teaching the postgraduate master's program in, oh, in continence and women's health. I we think, do do I think but, one of your students might have got in touch with me recently. Is there a prolapse course there at this moment as well? Uh, so there's a, that's my other colleague, Tr uh, Trish Newman. Patricia yeah, Newman. yeah. So she was one of my supervisors for my PhD and we've been... She did um, a multi-centre study around Australia looking at the treatment of stress incontinence way back 20 years ago. Yeah. Where, and that was when we first formed a sort of like a research group as a whole sort of thing for Australia. And we looked and she, she's amazing. She, you know, brought us all together, sort of standardised where we were at. And it was really from there we sort of moved forward as a group. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, so that was her PhD, but she's been very instrumental at setting up uh, uh, training for the use of pessaries here. Yeah. Right, 
the clinical guidelines, you definitely want to chat to her. She's gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I, I think they were they were querying one juice, and it's about the kind of um, physicality of being able to access your own pelvic floor. I mean, right. you know, you always come out a master's. You don't learn anything, but you come out with a million questions of like, and a bit of an idea of how to do stuff. Um, and one of the things that I really wanted to go on to is about the acceptability and the kind of the lived experience of having a condition and having to do manual intravaginal treatment and kind of exploring that a bit more. And I think um, one of the girls that got in touch with me was interested in uh, and my research didn't touch on any of that at all. It just physically um, I asked people to self one. So um, they were doing that. But it's quite an interesting one because a lot of women are put off pessaries because they think when they're in, they're in. Um, and the doctor has it's really kind of like a passive treatment but it's as you know as physios we goodness me as a woman you put in your tampon you take out your tampon why is it any different if they can get it into the right position yes so again now there's a big um increase in people being interested in test refitting but what we're interested also in is actually getting strict guidelines around it too yeah. Because there's something we want to make it more available, but we don't want things to go wrong so that people, uh, you know, a bit like the mesh story, if then something goes wrong, then nobody wants it. Yeah. And so we don't want to have um, people um, having problems with pessaries because then that'll give them a bad name as well. So yeah. she's really trying to, and she's, so she's running a unit through the University of South Australia, which is looking at um, using transperineal ultrasound, uh, really mm -hmm. understanding the anatomy, really understanding prolapse and learning how to fit pessaries. And you get mm -hmm. assessed for your, and you get assessed for your competency actually at fitting them. Yeah. So it's a really comprehensive course um, and as part of our masters you we have one optional unit that you can choose and that's one of the units you can do so okay. we thought don't re reproduce what we're doing over in Perth yeah she's at, added a unit so you can um, choose to do we have a pain unit as well which is done with the musculoskeletal physios you can choose that one or you can do the um, more advanced prolapse course. Oh, so. Australia is where it's at at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> totally where it's at. I, I want to come over and do all of these courses. The, yeah, um, we're very passionate about it, um, and it's 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 our after musculoskeletal and sports. It's our fastest growing um, group, and we're yeah we're the um, uh, the fourth largest now um, special interest group. So Brilliant. and we're a lot more interest in the men's health too with all the um prostatectomy stuff so mm. you know it's, it's, a, um, it's a massively emerging field in the uk as well the um our numbers are growing exponentially i think we're the second as well we're the second largest specialist interest group in the uk um but you know i'm definitely seeing a lot more um uh whereas kind of eight ten years ago with students coming through you'd you'd mention what you do and they'd treat you like you were some kind of i don't know um dirty or leper or ooh. Whereas now they're kind of, they've got a bit more of an appreciation. I think there has been a lot to go on in kind of a bit more of a women's empowerment and the younger generation are a bit more aware of that, or that at least physios coming through generationally are aware of that. So there's a bit more of an openness to, to yeah. kind of look at genital issues and, and more intimate treatment. So, I, mean, I, I'm, I work a lot with the musculoskeletal physios and so many people with persisting back pain or um, other issues have pelvic floor issues and I think yeah. they're realising how we have to co-treat and, um, uh, and how useful that is if you get those pelvic issues right yeah. then obviously it helps everything else so well, we're, um, we're trying to work on that as well trying to get um, the pelvic health integrated into university I mean that's my um, with my other yeah. hat on from POGP, um, from the exec, the, um, we're trying to find ways in which we can encourage um, pelvic health treatment to be part of normal um, training. So I do a little bit of um, kind of assistant lecturing, associate lecturing at Cardiff Uni. And, you know, they'll be doing, the kid, they do funny stuff. I love them. They're, they're great because they're um, the first years. They do funny exercise things. And they're talking about shoulder rehab and all the rest of it. And I'm there going, have you thought about what position you're going to put their pelvis in? 
to do this. <laughs> but it, it's about trying to get, if we can get the lecturers more comfortable with talking in public health language, then it becomes normal for the kids as well, or, you know, mutual yeah. students coming through, that it's a normal part of treatment that needs to be considered. Yeah, but exactly. If you've got any, yeah. I mean, there's been a lot going around on the global groups online at the moment, but if you've got any particular tips on how to um, get the UK to be like Australia and be so uh, really uh, pushing physiotherapists getting into the profession, then please send them over because we are, we're I trying to look at our succession management at the moment. The voice, uh, I think, I mean, Pilates and the core, which yeah. again, double-edged sword, um, was when people started talking about it. And with the trans-abdominal ultrasound, I've always got that there's two hacks to me that one, it really opened up a lot more people talking about the pelvic floor and um, feeling okay to assess it because yeah. they didn't have to undress people. Yeah. On the other hand, then we got a lot of misdiagnosis because trans-abdominal ultrasound only is one little bit of the picture. Yeah. So yeah. it was good. It was our best marketing tool, but also um, uh, on the other hand, you know, we have people thinking that just by doing that they they're able to give the advice um and maybe mm -hmm. they don't get it right <laughs> so there's a little halfway somewhere that maybe works yeah but, I mean, uh, the whole of physio isn't it so we're yeah trying to get people to um i think it's the softer kind of the softer more um socially acceptable side of pelvic health um yeah I, with my patients, I always talk about the socially acceptable exercises versus the not so socially acceptable. But the kind of like breast cancer treatment, um, pregnancy, uh, go, pelvic girdle pain, that kind of stuff, that can pull people yeah. in a little bit if they get interested. Yeah, yeah exactly. And uh, again, I think, well, we see a lot of people that are doing core, Pilates, those things suddenly yeah. have to think, oh, gosh, there's one bit of that we don't know anything about. Yeah. And so we find out more so yeah and that's what you get in the wonderful world so this is where i want to pick your brain because i had a little bit of an idea which um i have these ideas and then i think oh crikey that's probably a phd in itself um but one of the things because i know that you've done lots of work in ultrasound yeah and looking at actual um measurements and um anatomical features and the use of ultrasound lots of stuff like that um and one of my thoughts, because we've been kind of vaguely chatting on and off about graded motor imagery in pelvic pain, yeah. Yeah. was, and maybe this is a question for you, and this, I'm sorry if this causes more PhDs, but um, <laughs> I was wondering in, if you've ever come across anything where people have looked at studying, kind of like with your prolapse, um, what, what your colleague's doing with the course and possibly with patients, where if you study biofeedback with an ultrasound with a patient, does it make them then more amenable to progressing through graded motor imagery? My thought process being most of us at some point have got access to ultrasound machines and it would then sometimes uh, the kind of the forefront brainy stuff, which I really love um, can, can be really kind of to some, um, some people kind of newer to working in pelvic pain. It can be quite complex thinking, well, how am I, meant to be doing my interval training and my greater motor imagery and how do we do that in a pelvis where I just get them to think about having a wee what what do I do um but actually being able to do a session where you just do some biofeedback with a patient where you really give them anatomical knowledge using an ultrasound um and show them everything does that then change their perception or their ability to look at images and think through can, images? different different people and I think you know some people are real visual learners yeah and, and the ultrasound can be a real moment for people like oh now I understand oh that's where it is <laughs> and, and other people go just I don't I'm not sure what you're looking at it all looks a bit gray yeah. to me yeah. and, and um, it, it can be quite a different thing but some people really get that sense of and also if you're a little bit frightened about having an internal examination and you can just watch your pelvic floor moving at that one step removed yeah um, actually that can really break down some of the fear around the pelvis and stuff it's a really nice uh intro into the pelvis 
that's assuming that the pelvic floor will move. You yeah. have those for that you go to and nothing moves. So yeah. um, it's not that helpful an experience. Yeah. Um, but most people, you know, if we've got something to watch at, um, and sometimes I'll do it after I've done some pelvic floor releases, mm -hmm. uh, that then they've actually got a bit of, um, of, of movement now and, yeah. and actually watching that straight away. Because when you've got poor proprioception, you can't believe, am I really relaxing? And that's yeah. often the hard the contraction bit they can feel but they just can't feel the release yeah and so then if you can and i find in standing it's actually often better because then they can get that sense of drop do you do transperineal uh, in standing um you can do i tend to um um when i'm just doing it for that um release yeah. um often quite nice trans abdominally as I say, after you've just released the muscles, so you've got a bit of um, new range. Yeah. Because it all feels different. But yeah. they just can't work out the proprioception. And if you can see it lifting and then you can get that sense of that drop and they can actually watch it, mm. you're like, oh, I'm relaxing. Whoa. And I know... <laughs> Um, Maeve Whelan's, you know, sniff, flop and drop or something. Um, <laughs> sometimes I, I just get them to think of that, you know, and just drop, you know. Yeah. And then they yeah. Yeah. We were talking um, about this on the course actually at the weekend that um, at the moment I've got quite a run of patients that are finding it difficult to engage with their pelvic floor. So they're, they're really struggling to find it to begin with. And um, yeah. you know, you've got a toolbox of a million different things that you can do to try and get them to find that pelvic floor and help, help it feel the release. But um, we were talking about the fact, hi. Um, <laughs> Hello. <laughs> That's Geordie, my husband. <laughs> um, we were talking about the fact that sniff, up and drop is fantastic. And as we were talking about it, all of us did it because I was teaching last weekend. Um, but that sometimes that's a bit of a complex um, thing for patients to get kind of you know patting your stomach and rubbing your tummy yeah. um, and that actually just getting them to um, take a deep breath or my favorite that I've been doing for a while especially if they're supine and I'm finding that they're rigid they can't do abdominal breathing and everything else I just tell them to relax into their armpits or think about really really breathing into their armpits and then you get a full kind of trunk relaxation and I find that that um, on pelvic floor palpation you get a massive drop as well and then you go great whatever you just did keep doing that um yeah I'm, I'm working on that and yeah by um ultrasound can be a really lovely way of of showing people that they are achieving because we need all of these different tools don't we in ways of yeah and different things work for different people at different times and sometimes yeah i, I just I, I sort of a bit guided more with the patient of what, yeah. what works and some people just you know, words work for them, other people hands on tummies and, you know, on, uh, you know, the coccyx area and breathing into that and actually feeling that movement and other people need to see it, you yeah. know, so it's that uh, trying to go your visual auditory kinetic and try all of them and see which one yeah. <laughs> yeah. sticks and then they come back and say, oh, it's really great, I've been using and whatever they've got you've got a bit of a cue in what might actually be a good yeah. way to and we all get those that. patients that you've tried 15 things and you still can't get them to find their pelvic floor at which point you just think well okay what are we going to do let's let's do some exercise let's do other stuff yeah. let's go let's swimming get the pelvis to move and yeah um, challenge too <laughs> yeah i i also love i think from a um from a GMI point of view, I love the point where um, it happens rarely, but when you get someone with, I, I see a lot of bladder pain patients, um, and where you get someone that's quite young, so their anatomy hasn't yet had the process of time and gravity and childbirth and all the rest of it, um, so mostly females, and you put the ultrasound on and they're holding the anatomy like this, and you put the ultrasound on and it looks exactly the same. And they go, oh, that's great, especially when they feel like maybe their, their bladder is all tied up inside or something and I can say well look you've got a really nice line and I don't really tell them that their bladder looks like a piece of toast but I say look you know you can see 
that it's um, you know it's coming up into a nice bag we've got some space between these different sections and I find that mentally can be quite powerful because the brain really um, I go on a lot about in the course about threat and I'm sure this is yeah. something that, that we all feel but if you can't see something and your brain considers it threatening and I know this is the basis of pain I'm partly saying this for people that are, are listening but um, then your brain given incomplete data will always defer to negative because it's the point of it is to keep you alive you know we're always looking for the bears you know, where are the yeah. bears? Where are the bears that are going to attack me? Where, where are the bears that are, you know, currently eating my bladder or vagina or whatever else? And actually trying to give the whole point of, well, GMI is a, a special technique, obviously, but trying to give people ways of visualizing that there are no bears in yeah. their pelvis. So how, how do you do that? How do you break down that kind of mental imagery for people? Um, I use color a lot. Um, and getting people to visual, I ask them, what colour do you see your pelvis? And it can be very interesting. Yeah, that's a really good one. Just like, oh, yeah, ah, I'd never thought of it. And then it's either, sometimes it's bright red, if they sometimes have had a lot of menstrual pain and things. Other people, it's black. I've yeah. had concrete. I've had just a grey space. Um, and uh, actually, um, I can't remember, of course, now talking to you, I, I can't remember, but the part of the brain that processes colour is very close to um, where pain. So, again, using colour and changing the colour can yeah. really help. So often, so if it's bright red, I'll say, you know, imagine when you look out at a sunset and it's got all those lovely yellows and oranges and just try and bring in some yellow and orange so that as you do that breath in, you're actually um, uh, trying to uh, get that um, uh, um, yellow coming in so it's soft and it uh, changes. Yeah. And it really interesting. I, That's a really I like the sunset idea. That's a really, really lovely idea. Um, I've done lots of um, uh, kind of mindfulness before, which is I've never thought about kind of just physically changing sunsets. It's a good one because um, we've done things like um, choose a you know think about what what would be a healing color for you. So a lot of people choose green or blue or you know, gentle soft colors, and then um, headspace style um, starting with a ball of light that's really healing and it feels soothing. Grow that ball of light within your pelvis so that whatever healing color it's got. Um, it's got you know opacity and space and warmth and calm and whatever else yeah. and imagining that travel through the body but I think you, yeah you really have to get people on board um, and trusting you and that can take a couple of sessions before they're like yeah. might what I'm meditating better this isn't physio where you know where's your where's your massage and your magic sponge <laughs> yeah no so language is so important and uh yeah i'm uh, very interested in in the words we use and of course the nocebo effect is yeah. uh, is very powerful and how many people go and they see their either with the endo that it's all red and inflamed and or if they've had, had together testoscopy sometimes the doctor shows them the bright red yeah uh, light their bladder well yeah. how strong of that is a, a nocebo effect for yeah. your whole brain so if you can calm that down and change the color change the thought um really uh important this one lady i had she she um when i first asked her that she told me that she saw it as black and she was actually an mm. artist but because of her pelvic pain she'd stopped painting mm. and then Few months later, she came in and she said, "Oh, I started painting again." And I stood back, and then um, I saw what I'd actually painted, and it was all in rainbow colours. She bought a picture oh. of it, and it was actually her uterus and the um, the ovaries, but it looked like a butterfly. Yeah, it was all in yeah, yeah. And she said, "I just realised that's my pelvis now," and yeah. it was just good that you know um so i keep that little photo in my drawer and i show people um just so that um they can see their pelvis as something else as a part from this area that's caused them so many problems yeah just giving them love and actually uh, a different picture can really i think help <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely that's a beautiful story there's 
we you know there's so many people that just um have never engaged with it or the engagement they've had with it has always been so negative like you say with the nocebo language one lady springs to mind that had had um, a 40 year 45 year history of pain and it had been a string she could name and you could really feel that she was living the um the experience again and she could name and give you exact words that the consultants that had told her that um to start off with that her womb wasn't going to be um strong enough to hold a baby then um that she was so scarred from the surgeries that she'd had after she had a bleed with a c-section that um she needed you know it was really scarred and that's where the pain was coming from and that she just had to put up with it because they couldn't take away that and then that you know it was so um rotten inside that she needed a hysterectomy and then and 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 then the finally the the consultant that had sent it to me with prolapse symptoms um telling her that there was just everything had, it had gone her pelvic floor had gone and my words to her was gone where where's it gone <laughs> you know yeah. isn't it it's not fallen on the floor. It's not gone anywhere. And actually she had a lovely grade four. It's just that the pelvic, when the consultant said stick finger squeeze, there wasn't any activation because it was like this already. So um, she just needed to down train and that got rid of her symptoms, but they hang on to this image. The image that you, you talk to people becomes what they see because they can't see it. Um, yeah. So really, yeah, there's um, really kind of thinking about your language. And I find I catch myself sometimes um, because I'm so, I'm like you, I'm, I'm slightly obsessed with nocebo language and giving people better ideas. So even if I am particularly concerned about their potential histology or um, their symptoms, I'll never mention it. I'll write it to the GP, I'll write it to their consultant, but I'll, I'll mention they need to have things done, but I'll put it in a way that's just, you know, like, oh yeah, it's fine. Just because you don't want to set off that threat center, you want to keep them sub threat. Because it shouldn't hurt and it shouldn't create pain. And um, there's a lady at the moment that's really teaching me that, that I've been seeing for a long time, who um, she, uh, about seven years ago, a physio told her not to bend over because she had a, um, a disc prolapse. And so she hasn't bent over in seven years. Yeah. So she's got kind of an erector spiny, which has about a centimeter of movement and prolapse symptoms because she's got so much pressure intra-abdominal pressure in the system um and she was having significant really scary back pain leg pain really terrifying to her and just feeling more and more crippled because the as i keep telling her the limitations that she put on her own movement were getting smaller and smaller until her body just it has no options for movement and so everything hurts because the only way she can move is in one way so she spent a year bending over um, and me <laughs> ostensibly making her bend, making her move, making her stretch, everything that's in significant contracture. And the pain's gone away. Oh, Most yeah. of it. So our, our clinic, having, having Pete and uh, in our clinic, we've seen masses of people that come over cord. You know, yeah. they're so stiff that they just can't bend. They're frightened of bending. But you think the same thing with prolapse. You know, once you've been told you've got a prolapse, people often get so frightened of mm. what they can do that when you get to see them, they're often overactive because they're actually just holding on so tight. Yeah, and so they, I find they're really peripherally overactive as well. Sorry, it's superficially yeah. overactive, aren't they? Um, yeah, and they're just often doing too much uh, because they're frightened everything's going to fall out. Yeah. And when you assess the products, you're thinking, it's not actually that bad. <laughs> um, um, uh, but again, to always think, you know, the heaviness can actually be overactivity. That can be actually, at the end of the day, it's fatigue. Yeah. Um, and what they're interpreting uh, is sometimes... Uh, uh, you know, is fear, and especially if your mum's had prolapse, you've known someone had surgery and it didn't go well, and all that. You think, oh my god, anything I do, you know, if I oh, I mustn't run and I mustn't do this. No, you need to be strong, get going, girl. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people, or a lot of people email me because they before they come in because they find me online and they they'll say, Um, the physios told me not to run, not to do planks, not to squat not to do this, not to do that. And I, I keep quoting Julie Weeb at them. I mean, she put something up the other day saying, um, it's not don't do something, it's what strategy am I going to use? To get you to back to where you, what's your goal? Yeah. And how can we get you there? 
or otherwise, uh, again, here we've got a, a big thing uh, about levator avulsions. Yeah. And um, uh, people being, I've had people, oh, well, the physio told me that my, my, uh, my muscles have been torn off the bone on both sides. So, um, yeah, I haven't, I've been too scared to walk and I, you know, I can't pick up my, my daughter. And uh, I was like, okay, well, let's just investigate that and, you know, and work out, well, you've still got muscles there. Why don't we make the most, make you strong with what we've got? And uh, again, I think, yeah, so we've, we've, we've had a bit of, uh, again, now we know that there are avulsions and we can actually palpate them and stuff. It's the way we translate that information. Well, you've had a baby, you have been stretched, so no wonder you feel it's difficult to contract your pelvic floor because it has been stretched. But let's strengthen what you've got and let's definitely strengthen your legs and your tummy so that we, you know, as a mother, you're going to have to, uh, lift and bend and move how can we get you strong to be able to do that yeah. so that was the sub subject at our um, physio conference uh, this year we had over in Sydney uh, talking I don't do you know Anthony Lowe um, yeah. online he so we were talking at the same session how we got to stop hurting women by telling them not not to do things we've actually got to work out what they can do and train them up to it and yeah. if you have if you can't run anymore well should we get you swimming or doing something different but you've still got to get strong yeah, and I think that's that's such a key message that um as our understanding of pelvic health is evolving I mean I'm I, I'm continually learning which is um which is the great thing about this profession is that we're really on I feel like we're on the um kind of the edge of research and you know Washington was hugely inspiring with what everyone's doing in pain and I saw the tweets coming through from your conference actually um of, of what was going on and how things are pushing forward but yeah getting it's one of those crazy things that will tell people not to do a sit-up or a um plank and that I do have issues with them or a jumping or whatever else it is but then they go and pick up the four-year-old with cerebral palsy or they go and, you know, put washing on the line or they've got a really big dog they haven't told you about or they, um, you know, they, they don't have someone else at home to help them. So they're up a ladder doing DIY and crazy things. So yeah. why are we restricting movements if someone's got to achieve something or someone wants to achieve something, we should be getting them there. And I get loads of women back to CrossFit. I, um, you know, you, it's now getting... Um, it, it's a it's a routine thing now I had someone come in this week post hysterectomy really really miserable about the hysterectomy um and what's happened to her um but kind of saying well almost almost um grieving the loss of running and that yeah she's now old she's only about 53 she's now old and so she's not going to be able to run because everything will fall out because the consultant told her that she shouldn't run and I said well maybe I don't want you doing a marathon every day right now, but let's get you stronger and let's work up towards it. And what do you want to achieve? Well, she just wants to do a 5k on a Saturday as park run. Well, fine. Okay. What else can we do during the week? And what can we do to get you to be able to do that on the weekend? Yeah. So if you want to achieve here, you've got to train to there so that this, it's really hard. yeah, no yeah. challenge. Yeah. And so to give them inspiration to actually go through steps to actually get them to where they, and if their goal's totally unrealistic, then to counsel them how to maybe set a different sort of goal that yeah. maybe do a different uh, way that you do it on the bike instead of uh, on the, you know, running if they really can't run, you know. But yeah. the, or, could they, or could they have a pessary and run, you know. Yeah, or use a contiform, which we're not meant to do, but nonetheless, a lot of people do. Um, yeah, I've got a lovely lady at the moment who I've been working with for over a year who started off post hysterectomy and endometriosis, huge amounts of pelvic pain ongoing, who couldn't sit down for 10 minutes, five minutes when she went back to work, was truly miserable, huge amount of symptoms. And she's now doing an Olympic level triathlon, Olympic distance that, triathlon. There was a blog on one of your lives. Yeah, yeah. So she's on my website because um, she's very kind of open and proud about what she's doing. And I'm hugely proud. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I've sent um, some of my endometriosis patients to, to look at that. So, you know, you I will let her know because she'll be so happy that she's actually, you know, yeah. making a huge difference. Yeah, my story is hugely inspirational. 
And you're so good at putting things up. I'm like a dinosaur with the internet. So <laughs> oh, my patients help me. But she had yeah. she's been so um, passionate and driven, and I think really taken it on board that even at the lowest ebb, when I've said, "Well, this is just your body readjusting," and you know we're we're trying to keep sub threat, it's looking for the bears, and it's saying, "Well, this is a new thing. I haven't done this before. This is probably dangerous." And, you know, she's having inflammatory flares in response to things, but she's doing so well. And now instead of um, emails um, saying, oh, I, you know, I, I couldn't sit for 10 minutes or I managed to get half an hour into work, but I'm just having to get up all the time or pain. Now we're getting much more into, oh, I did a 10K at the weekend straight after a 20 mile bike ride and I was in so much pain and I've just gone, how, look how far you've come. This is amazing. You're, you're doing really well. Go back to your self care. You know what you're doing. Um, let your body express itself but don't be threatened don't feel fearful of the pain um, but you know get out there and, and, and do the run do the swim do all of it so she's actually um, the race is in uh, a couple of months and I'll be there cheering at the end oh fantastic oh well tell her run. that that story that's been spread around Australia too. oh I will <laughs> she's going to be proud um, so the other thing that I can um, from a pain point of view that really challenged me um, and this really kind of changed my mindset in Washington I've been playing with it for a while but really really changed my mindset is I went to Washington with kind of two or three questions that I wanted to um, get answered by the the people in the know and one of them was why do we get a hypertonicity of the pelvic floor why do we get an increase in tone in pain because you can give all of the kind of lovely almost philosophical responses well it's a spasm well it's protective well it's whatever but I couldn't ever um, get a, a response which was um, a kind of suitable enough I don't know it made sense in my mind it was scientific enough of a reason that that would happen and then finally um, Dr Peters and Dr Chalimsky stood up and um, told me why and that's fine so to do with venous backflow and autonomic dysregulation of the pelvic floor and those three little bits of the brain that I can never remember the names of but one of them is the supplementary motor area um, Jason Kutcher's team talking about how that regulates pelvic floor tension and is very connected with a sense of urgency or a sense of how full your bladder or bowel is or full your bladder is and that those are very connected and so then you get a down chain um, up regulation of pelvic floor activity as well as the peripheral stuff bingo great so i was definitely brought up on the thoughts and the, the research that i've been through that working a pelvic floor that is hypertonic or increased tone yeah is not a great idea because it's just going to increase the tone and um, i went around talking to people at conference and there's Pro professor peters kind of going well i get all of my patients interval training and i was like what you get them running you get them squatting you get them doing cycling what but they are hypertonic is that not going to make them worse um and he was just like no no we make amazing changes and since kind of being less scared myself of making my patients with high tone work hard and I'll get them in the gym and squatting and lunging. And in the, if it, they can't do that, they're in the pool jumping around because I'm, I'm lucky we've got a hydro pool um, or on the Alter-G. Alter -G. But, and actually finding that a therapist bias was limiting patients much more than their own limitations. Um, yeah. Again, it's hard, isn't it? Because, you know, we've all seen patients that have been made worse by doing sit-ups because of their prolapse is worse. Yeah. And yet, um, I've had lots of uh, discussions with Carrie Bow, and then we went to look a little bit at intra-abdominal pressure and sit-ups and stuff. But yeah, at the same time, that was a really sorry. Just to, <laughs> just to jump in there, if you if anyone listening to this hasn't read that article, that was brilliant. And um, it, again, it was a game changer for me. The kind of going well, abdominals work and all that kind of stuff works, but actually, the the pressure, intra-abdominal pressure forces didn't increase. Yeah. necessarily so you can have situations in which it's safe but sorry Gary Gary go on yeah. yeah so it's it's you know trying to get people to exercise more mm. um, and and to do the best thing for their body and it's it's really um a hard call to to be you know trying to trying to get people to do more you know if you're overactive um some people are going to the gym and doing all that interval training but they're actually holding their core the whole time and that's yeah. not going to help them. No. but if you taught them about how to breathe through and actually you when you when you really work hard you actually get get exhausted and you get tired 
Um, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, my son just walked into. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating. And that was a whole a bit of the discussion we had in, in Sydney of, because, of, you know, we've got our CrossFitters and people going, oh, my God, you can't have people doing that with pelvic floor. And at the same time, how do you counsel people? And are we stopping people being strong? Mm. And actually, we need people to be strong. And it's, it's how we pace through. You know, we've got our Pelvic Floor First website in mm. Australia, which is actually yeah. quite conservative, which is great information for people. But then they need to go beyond that. And it's hard to, to do it because it is so individual, you know. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It's, and it's, uh, so it is individual. And that's the truth of it, that... Um, because you get you you learn a set of principles in physio school that don't apply to everyone. So um, uh, Sam Gillard has done some lovely work in DRAM recently, and she she's oh, been all over this. Yeah, um, talking to lots of different people. She presented at our conference last year that um, her ultrasound work has shown that not everyone has the same strategy for um, abdominal curl in, and not everyone has the same outcome. So, which is it yeah. seems obvious now, but it's quite nice that. Yeah. She, gone and looked at that so some people and bottom up drivers and and exactly with the ultrasound you can assess that and so you can say yeah actually you're fine to do sit-ups and other people uh you're not (laughs) running away so you're um no it's uh my um son his girlfriend just come back there um just walking in so we've got a different view now (laughs) still sunny it's lovely and sunny (laughs) oh it's yeah it's so interesting to chat to you Gillian it's it's, uh it's good to share yeah it's been really lovely and thank you I don't want to take any more of your time because you've got family um now coming over for a Friday night um but thank you so much for talking and sharing your absolute wisdom um it would be lovely to catch up again at some point um and and just have a chat Hopefully I'll meet you in person um, uh, at one of the conferences sometime soon. But well, we definitely want to see you in Australia. Oh, I'd, lo- I'd love to come over. World Congress of Abdominal and Pelvic Pain, I think, is coming to London next year. So okay. um, if you, yeah, get put, it, put a date in the diary. I don't know what the date is yet. Yeah, but I'm 2019. There. I'm, there. I'm there. So I went to Amsterdam and Nice, and so Washington was the first one that I missed. <sighs> uh, um, so yeah, just um, uh, uh, America's that little bit further. Uh, a little so, bit more expensive as well, yeah. So we'll definitely be there in London next year. Brilliant. Well, I'm really looking forward to meeting you then. Um, have a lovely Friday night, and we're going to sign off there. And thank you so much for talking to um, me. And I'm sure we'll continue our conversations via email about patients and stuff. But it's been lovely. an absolute pleasure to chat to you. Oh, Chat to you later. See you then. Bye. Bye.